Next, we want to minimize exposure to damaged fats. So we want to avoid fried foods completely. Just do not fry foods in, in fat. It's, it's not a good plan. We want to minimize or avoid oils in cooking. We don't want to ex expose um, oils to high temperature. And especially, especially if the oil starts to smoke, then we're producing products of oxidation that are pretty toxic to human health. Uh, we don't want to burn high fat foods or allow them to blacken. And we want to store high fat foods, including shelled nuts and seeds, in the refrigerator or freezer. This is really important, and a lot of people don't know this. They have, you know, they have all sorts of mason jars of different nuts and seeds on their shelf. Well, nuts and seeds, you see, nature has a way of protecting the, the fragile fats in, in these foods, and that's with a shell. When you remove that shell, you're exposing that nut or seed to oxidation. And so over time, you'll get more and more oxidized fats. Keep them in the freezer or refrigerator to prevent that from happening. And you want to minimize processed foods, of course, as well. And then, of course, you want to make whole plant foods your primary sources of fat. High-fat whole plant foods are rich in fiber and antioxidants and phytochemicals and plant sterols and stanols and all of these protective components. But we want to minimize concentrated fats and oils because they provide a lot of calories with very few nutrients. I often say the you know, oils are to the fat family as sugars are to the carbohydrate family. Sugars and white flour, they're highly processed. The fiber and many of the nutrients have been removed. Neither is poison. It's, you know, the dose that makes the poison in very small quantities. You know, a couple of drops of sesame oil to give that kind of flavor in a peanut sauce. No big deal. But it's when you're using massive amounts, you know, pouring it on your salads, using it in, you know, in your cooking in, in large quantity. Not such a good plan. Uh, instead, use nuts and seeds as bases, or nut and seed butters or avocados as your bases in salad dressings, because then you get the fiber and all of the nutrients that go with those foods. We want to ensure sufficient omega-3 fatty acids. And for most people eating plant-based diets, we're looking at about two to four grams of alpha-linolenic acid a day. And, and so how do we get this? Well, an ounce of walnuts gives us 2.6. And a tablespoon of, of ground uh, flax seeds is 2.6. And if we grind them, it'll be a little, little more of a heaping tablespoon. But, but we're, we're looking at, grind, we want to grind them because, uh, you know, these flax seeds are slippery little, little things and they go right through us. So if you grind them, you make that omega-3 more available for, for absorption. A chia seeds, about 1.7 in a tablespoon. Hemp seeds, about 0.9. And leafy greens, half the fat in leafy greens or more is, is omega-3. But they're so low in fat, you'd have to eat a truckload. You'd have to eat like a horse or a cow to get enough. You need about 30 cups, 20 or 30 cups, right? So, and some people, you know, eat like that, but not very many because you're eating all day long or you're juicing a lot. But uh, so you can get some from leafy greens, but you usually need some nuts or seeds to, to balance it out. So the next question where omega-3s is concerned is, don't we need fish for EPA and DHA? And the answer is no. Actually, EPA and DHA are made by microalgae, plants from the sea. And so, yes, you can consume fish, which got it you know, at some point along the food chain from the microalgae, or you can cut out the fish and just eat the microalgae. You can actually culture it. You don't have to rape the ocean to get it. Uh, it can be cultured, grown, and, and you can take it as a supplement or sometimes it's added to foods. And so that, that works uh, very well. So do we need to take DHA and EPA? You know, the answer is we don't really know. Um, vegans do very well in terms of chronic disease, in terms of brain function, in terms of risk of you know, brain disorders, we do very well. Would we do better if we took DHA and EPA? Vegans have levels of EPA and DHA that are significantly lower than omnivores, probably about one-third that of omnivore, one-third in some cases, one-half, but definitely significantly lower levels. And so if our levels were boosted, would it give us an even bigger advantage is the question. And we don't know. Uh, the research just isn't there yet. But we do know 
that EPA and, and DHA have been associated with some health benefits. So to me, it makes sense for people that have increased needs for EPA and DHA, like pregnant and breastfeeding women, to consider taking uh, a supplement. However, you know, young women are the most efficient converters of, EPA and D, or of ALA to EPA and DHA. So alpha linolenic acid, the plant omega-3, can be converted into these bigger, more unsaturated, larger omega-3 fatty acids that are more biologically active. The body can do that, but the ability to do that is, is somewhat limited. But it's highest in young women because they need to be able to convert for the you know, brain growth of their infants and so on. Uh, but still, they may want to consider. And there are people that don't convert plant omega-3s to long-chain omega-3s very efficiently. People with diabetes, metabolic syndrome, or hypertension are poor converters. Populations who have traditionally consumed a lot of fish are poor converters. And, and um, this is because the enzymes required for conversion, they just stop making as many because they don't need them. They're consuming preformed EPA and DHA. So if you don't need to be converting that enzyme, just we don't make as much of it. And so if that's been happening for many generations, they may, they may need to, to have a direct source. So microalgae supplements, there are a lot of supplements now available. And suggested intakes are two to 300 milligrams a day, or even just taking it two to three times a week to boost your, your sort of levels. Step six is to enhance gut flora. There are many benefits to healthy gut flora, and I'm just going to zip through them. One of them is enhanced nutritional status, because gut flora actually produces nutrients. Uh, can protect against pathogens, promote healthy body weight. You can actually get some energy and short-chain fatty acids that protect against colon cancer from, from your gut flora. You get better immunity, reduced inflammation. You get better um, maintenance of the integrity of the, the sort of lining of the intestinal wall. Uh, you get better brain function. You get increased um, uh, insulin secretion when you have a healthy gut flora. So how do we improve gut flora? Well, we want to eat a diet high in prebiotics from beans, whole grains, asparagus, uh, Jerusalem artichokes, bananas, onions, and garlic. These are especially high in prebiotics. Uh, we want to eat food-based probiotics, like, you know, I would suggest non-dairy yogurts, fermented vegetables, sauerkraut, tempeh, miso. These are all foods with the probiotics in them. And prebiotics, for those of you that don't know, prebiotics are the, the food for the bacteria. Probiotics are the bacteria, just to get to, to, to understand that. Um, and then we want to minimize intake of foods that foster the growth of bad bacteria or harmful bacteria. Processed foods, fried foods, refined carbohydrates, and meat. We want to take probiotics, especially if we're using antibiotics, and avoid excessive alcohol consumption. Step seven is to maximize antioxidants and phytochemicals. And phytochemicals are really just chemicals that plant makes to protect themselves. So it enhances their survival. It's their chemical defense system. Many phytochemicals are also protective to people. They reduce inflammation. They block tumor formation. They can kill cancer cells. They stimulate enzymes, destroy pathogens, reduce blood pressure, uh, improve endothelial function. They just do. It, I mean, the list is really pages and pages long. They do a lot of things that will potentially protect against uh, disease. And then antioxidants are compounds that help to protect, uh, protect against oxidative stress and, and disease processes. And so how do we enhance phytochemicals and antioxidants? Well, think color. The richest sources um, of, of phytochemicals and antioxidants are often the most colorful. To maximize protection, we might want to choose the colorful vegetables rather than the less colorful uh, choices. You know, black instead of brown rice, or red instead of brown rice, red instead of white uh, beans, for example. So these are just some, even quinoa, you can get red or black versus white. You, you tend to get more phytochemicals when you choose the color. And also variety. The wider the range of plant foods in the diet, the wider the range of antioxidants and phytochemicals you will be consuming. 
We want to eat more raw foods. And the reason for this is that there are enzymes in raw foods that when we cook those foods, we destroy the enzymes that convert the phytochemicals into their active forms. So for example, myrosinase helps convert a compound called glucosinolates into the more active form called isothiocyanates, like sulforaphane, which is a very potent um, a detoxifier of carcinogen. So it's, it, you know, very, very important. And then we've got alanase, in, and myrosinase is in cruciferous vegetables, and alanase is in allium vegetables, and it helps convert allen to the active form allicin. And then the other thing we can do is to start, um, to start sprouting. And, and when a seed is germinated, anti-nutrients are broken down, Enzymes are released so that the stored forms of nutrients can be available for the plant growth. And the phytochemical army that's poised to protect the plant just multiplies. And, and so these are really helpful things as well. Step eight is to reduce harmful chemical residues and food additives. And so we're talking here about agrochemicals, environmental contaminants, products of food processing and cooking, and food additives. And when we consume these things, they can wreak havoc in a number of ways. They can cause oxidative stress and inflammation. They can disrupt hormones and, and be, if you will, obesogens, make, increase uh, obesity. They can damage vital organs, damage DNA and our central nervous systems, and they can increase the risk of chronic disease. So agrochemicals, uh, pesticides, plant growth regulators, uh, veterinary drugs like hormones and antibiotics and antimicrobials. And the way to avoid these things is to choose organic. And so this is, you know, a, it's a simple way. Not everybody can afford to do everything organic. Uh, but one thing that you can do is go to the environmental working groups, you know, Dirty Dozen and Clean 15. And if you have to buy some conventional, stick with the, the, the cleaner uh, uh, crops and, and buy the sort of the Dirty Dozen by organic at least. Environmental contaminants like heavy metals and persistent organic pollutants or POPs like PCBs, DDT and dioxin. Uh, packaging materials like lead and, and BPA and tin. And, and the most concentrated sources of heavy metals and POPs are animal products, fish, meat, and dairy products. And so what do we do? Eat lower on the food chain. Eat more plants, eat fewer animals, and use foods without excessive packaging, jars instead of cans, and BPA-free lining in cans. The products of high temperature cooking, heterocyclic, heterocyclic amines are known carcinogens. They're formed only when we cook meat at high temperatures, meat, poultry, fish, uh, at high temperatures. Plants can't form heterocyclic amines because you need, to have car you, you need to have creatine or creatinine in the food to make heterocyclic amines. Plants don't have any, so we don't have to worry about that. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are a second product of, of cooking. Uh, these are known mutagens. They're, they're linked with a number of cancers, and they're present in grilled or charred meat, poultry, and fish, but also in any plant food that's grilled and blackened. Uh, how we can avoid this is by avoid blackening foods and avoid heating foods above 392 degrees or Fahrenheit or 200 degrees cent centigrade. Uh, advanced glycation end products, these are, are um, basically compounds that are advanced um, products of the Maillard reaction and they're irreversible products of the Maillard reaction and they impair immune function. They accelerate aging, they contribute to pretty much every disease you can think of, including Alzheimer's disease. And what you see is they're highest in bacon, uh, broiled frankfurters, grilled or fried meat, but even uh, whipped butter, even fried tofu, uh, parmesan cheese, uh, even roasted nuts. Uh, so you can see it, it, it you know, they, they accumulate probably more in animal products than plants, but can uh, form in plant foods as well. Oh, and they, they um, I'm trying to remember, they, oh, well, they'll form at any temperature. Um, acrylamide uh, is, uh, is a, a substance that's formed from starchy foods, and 
the main component that forms acrylamide is, is something called um, uh, agarotene, or agarotene, which is, no, not agarotene, it's, um, uh, sorry, it's a, it, no, it's asparagine, <laughs> sorry, I'm mixing up the, the uh, um, chemical in mushrooms with asparagine, but asparagine is, in a, is the amino acid that you need to form acrylamide, and it's mostly found in, in potatoes, both sweet potatoes and regular potatoes, and so just to know if you're heating them above 248 degrees, which you always do when you bake, you're forming some of these compounds, but they're formed most when you deep fry. So potato chips and French fries are the worst. And I'm just going to whip down this. So how do we avoid this? We'll use food preparation methods that minimize the production of harmful compounds. So wet cooking methods instead of dry cooking methods. And if you're using dry, keep heat lower. And then finally, harmful food additives. You just want to avoid artificial sweeteners, all the, you know, read, you can read labels, but preferably use fewer foods with labels. <laughs> we want to be using whole foods. Uh, the most common food additive is salt, and 80% comes from processed foods. And if you look at the amount of salt in foods, like a t teaspoon of salt is 2,300 milligrams of sodium. You can go down this list, ramen, dill pickles, soup, tomato sauce, veggie burger, raisin bran, Italian dressing, potato chips, salted peanuts. You can actually eat an ounce of potato chips and an ounce of salted peanuts and get less sodium than you would from an ounce of raisin bran. And people go, no way, that's impossible. But when you put salt on the outside of a potato chip or a peanut, you taste it, it's just there. Whereas you put it inside batter and you make something like flake cereal and it's, it's throughout the batter, you don't taste it in the same way. So you need to read labels. Uh, step nine is to meet nutrients, um, meet your needs for all the nutrients of concern. And in plant-based diet, the biggest nutrients of concern are B12 and vitamin D. And we're not gonna talk a lot about these, but just know they need to be taken care of. And, and one of the things that I've done in my career as a dietitian is to create resources that help people to do vegetarian and vegan diets very well. Because to me, a failed vegan is really exhibit number one for why we need to eat meat. Uh, and, and, and so it's really important we get this right. And so the resources that you know, I've written and created and the food guides and so on are meant to be essentially foolproof. You'll, 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 you'll get this right if you follow these, these guidelines. And, and I mentioned that. And step 10 is to maintain a healthy body weight. So one thing that, that I think the blue zones, especially Okinawans, have done really well is something called Hari Hachi Boo. They eat until they're 80% full instead of stuffing themselves. So they're under eating a little bit all the time. And this is helpful. We want to minimize foods with added fat, sugar, and salt. Fat, sugar, and salt, you know, in nature, these flavors are so dilute. When you take and concentrate those flavors in processed foods, it messes up your appetite control center, and you can't stop eating them. And so this is something we just really need to be aware of. We need to say, these foods I'm just not going to do because I need to reacquaint my appetite control system with, with you know, whole, unadulterated foods. It makes a huge difference. We need to avoid supersizing, except for salad. We can supersize our salads. <laughs> and drink water, not sugar. Just do not ever drink sugar, period. That's an important uh, step. And there's no question that well-designed, whole food, plant-based diets are optimal for human health.